Hello, Kristen Knudsen, Production Manager and Technical Director at the College Light Opera Company, coming to you from Fabric Storage in the Costume Shop. Behind the Scenes with Kristen Knudsen is made possible by a generous gift from Clyde Tyndale and Deb Winograd. Last week at the theater, I demonstrated some faux finishing techniques. This week, I want to show you just some of the sewing machines we have in our costume shop and dive into some of the history of that machinery. And don't worry, if you don't even know how to thread a sewing machine, I'm going to demonstrate how to do just that on our industrial Juki, as well as on our very, very old Marrow Overlock machine. The invention of the sewing machine can't be nailed down to only one person. During the Industrial Revolution of the late 1700s through the mid-1800s, the textile industry was booming, and eager inventors and entrepreneurs generated an endless stream of specialized machinery patents. Not every proto-sewing machine made it into physical reality, but every hypothetical machine spawned a series of improved ideas, building on each other until arriving at a mechanism that resembles the household sewing machines of today. It was a mad dash of invention, and there were plenty of squabbles and lawsuits over patents and accusations of stolen technology. It is unknown if the design generally recognized as the first sewing machine was ever actually built. In 1790, an English cabinet maker, Thomas Saint, created plans for a hand-cranked machine intended to stitch leather. His patent was titled, and I kid you not, an entire new method of making and completing shoes, boots, spatter dashes, clogs, and other articles by means of tools and machines also invented by me for that purpose, and of certain compositions of the nature of Japan or varnish, which will be very advantageous and many useful appliances. That patent was ultimately misplaced and forgotten. The first design for a sewing machine using a needle with an eye in its point was created by prolific New York inventor Walter Hunt, who was also responsible for the safety pin, among other things. Hunt created a machine that utilized two needles and created a straight lock stitch seam, the same standard stitch on modern machines. But he abandoned his invention in 1838 for fear of putting seamstresses and tailors out of business. Almost simultaneously, a Boston tailor's apprentice by the name of Elias Howe developed a nearly identical design and patented it in 1846. Though a series of unfortunate events in Howe's life would prevent him from seeing any success with his own sewing machine, he made fierce legal pursuit of anyone he perceived to infringe upon his patent, and ultimately amassed millions in patent rights and royalties by the end of his life. By some accounts, Howe was approached by a machinist named Isaac Merritt Singer, seeking to make use of Howe's eye-pointed needle in his own sewing machine design. Other versions of the story say that Howe discovered Singer's design after the fact and sued him for patent infringement. Either way, Singer paid Howe thousands in royalties to make use of that needle. But I would say Singer came out on top of that deal given that Singer became a household name and hardly anyone remembers Elias Howe. Singer's first machine on the market was called Singer's Perpendicular Action Sewing Machine, or simply the Singer Sewing Machine. Singer started taking orders and manufacturing his sewing machines in late 1850, and the patent was officially granted in August of 1851. This early model was intended for industrial manufacturing rather than home use. He further refined his design by doing away with the hand crank in favor of a foot treadle and flywheel to motivate the action of the machine. An interesting bit of information about Isaac Merritt Singer. Machine work and inventing was his day job. Singer's real passion was acting. He quite literally ran away from his family at a young age to join a traveling troupe of performers, and he continued to work as an actor whenever he could, even running his own small touring company at one point. He just happened to be working in a Boston machine shop when he was given a sewing machine to repair, and he was inspired to develop a better machine. The rest is history. Singer proved to be a flamboyant and tenacious businessman, and at the height of his success became the first person to spend over a million dollars on a single marketing campaign. He certainly surrounded himself with drama, even in his personal life. If you'd like to dive down a real rabbit hole, do a little searching online about how many wives, mistresses, and children Singer had in his lifetime. It's wild. The Marrow Sewing Machine Company is best known for inventing the Overlock Sewing Machine. 
Originally established in 1838 as Joseph M. Merrow and Sons, it started as a knitting mill built on the site of Merrow's former gunpowder mill, which was destroyed in an explosion the previous year. The company's machine shop developed crocheting machines for edge finishing to streamline fabrication in the knitting mill, and by 1887 evolved to design, build, and market sewing machines exclusively. Though the transition at that time was largely motivated by a fire that destroyed the mill and forced the company to move. The crochet machine became known as a marrow machine, the first of what we recognize today as an overlock machine or serger. An overlock is a kind of stitch that sews over the edge of one or two pieces of cloth for edging, hemming, or seaming. Usually an overlock machine will cut the edges of the cloth as they are fed through, creating a clean, finished seam, but not every model includes this cutting feature. The term serger is a North American term for an overlock or marrowing machine with cutters. Overlockers typically utilize up to five independent spools of thread, some passing through stitching needles and some passing through loopers that form a knotted crochet look edging. This over edging prevents material fraying without the need for a rolled hem, but is flexible enough to use on knits and stretch fabrics. Take a look at any machine made t-shirt or apparel with any degree of stretch. You will likely find overlock edging in the hems and overlocked seams where the garment is pieced together. In the clock costume shop, we have a Mero MG3DW4, a compact industrial model that takes three spools and includes a cutter. Mero machines have looked pretty much the same since the early 20th century, and while ours may resemble the models seen in the 1906 catalog, the serial number reveals that our MG3DW4 was manufactured between 1979 and 1981. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. No need to constantly reinvent a machine that works. This particular model is no longer offered by the company, but parts are still easy to get. Executive and Artistic Director Mark Pearson is now joining us to share his knowledge of this machine and demonstrate how to thread it properly. Good thing about this machine is if you do find you need to uh, change your color or if you are running out of thread and if you can catch it before you run out, is rather than re-threading the entire machine, you can put a knot in your thread like that and you can pull your thread through one point to watch out for is the tension wheel because the knot may get broken there so we'll just skip that there up and it's going to end there at the needle where you're going to have to cut it but that saves a heck of a lot of time all right, now we're going to show you how to thread an overlock or marrow machine. I find it's easiest if you get the presser foot out of your way. So you can swing the plate out first. And then if you pull this lever up, then the presser foot will move aside. And this will give you uh, pretty good access to everywhere you need to be. That said, what you are going to need is probably a pair of tweezers. Uh, household tweezers will work. They also have machine tweezers. And uh, this little doohickey here, which is uh, a threader assistant. And this is really important when we get to the uh, what will be the blue thread, which has to go through this tube. And it's really hard to get it through that tube unless you have this wire, which fits up in there. So we are going to start with the uh, lower thread, which uh, for purposes of this demonstration is our red thread. So we grab uh, the end of our thread and it is going to go through here first. Then this is the tension wheel. It goes through the tension wheel. Then as we get lower, some of this we can do with our fingers and some of it we're gonna need the uh, We'll see why we need tweezers, but it is through there, and then it's going to go through there. There, I gotcha. All right, so he's through there. Then it's going to go down through this one, and then there's this one, which we always forget. By we, I mean me. Over there. Pull it back. 
get it down through that one. Oh, and be careful, see here, it's accidentally got looped around there. That'll really screw you up. So make sure that everything is flowing freely. All right. Now we're not quite out of the woods. We're going under here. And then you've got to come up, up through that guy. It's helpful also to remove uh, the plate, which covers the, the feed dogs, uh, just so you can see what you're doing. And again, this is another moment where we can say, if you can thread this without having to, uh, you know, if you can tie knots in the thread and pull it through that way, I strongly recommend doing that because this will take up uh, a bit of your afternoon. So we're going to take our uh, assistant needle here and we're going to go through this channel. And if we get it right, it'll also go through the eye of uh, the, yep, I think we got it. I hope you can see it there. And now we've got to get in there with our tweezers to pull it pull it up and up. And there you have it. And if you can see, I don't know if you can get the camera in there, but there's a swan neck sort of, uh, there, there it is. See yeah, it yeah. coming out? There we go. So that's your bottom thread. And see how that wraps around the other moving part? That's exactly what you want to see happen. And we're going to move on to our uh, second or uh, over, what will be the overlock thread, which for this we are using uh, the blue. So this will be our blue thread. Uh, a lot of threading, this thread is similar to the bottom one. So it comes in here first, the easy part. Obviously uh, through your tension wheel. Uh, tension is really important on all machines. Um, but here you're dealing with three separate tension wheels, so uh, it becomes even more important. So we're going to go down through here. Go down through that guy. Again, careful that you don't end up catching anything that you don't want to catch. So as you can see, it follows pretty much the same track as the under thread. Except when we get to this point, this guy has to shoot up through that tube. You see that tube, we've got to get it to go up there, and we're going to go back with our uh, wire needle. Thread the needle, pull some slack. And then we're going to go up through there, and then if you circle around the other side, you can see uh, the wire needle starting to poke up right there. And we're actually heading for this pull. So we're going to pull that out, get our thread through there. Nice. Um, so if you end up breaking the thread, uh, it's always a good idea to cut a good, clean, flush cut. It's just going to help you thread the rest of the way, and again back to our tweezers, and through there, oh, and we caught one of the feed dogs, don't want to do that, there you go, and if you pull them, they should have about the same tension on both of them. All right, so that are, those are both of our uh, overlock threads, which is really the hardest part, now we're in the home stretch, and now we need our actual uh, sewing thread, which for this demonstration is our black thread. I'm just going to reach up, get our thread, and we're going to thread that through here. And careful here with how your threads interact with each other because you don't want them to catch. So I'm going to pull a little bit on the other two. See, so now they tighten up and you can see how this is supposed to lay. Uh, next, you have another, your third tension wheel, which is here. So we're going to go uh, in there. And then I don't know if you can see, there's a little eye there. Again, one that can, you can easily miss. Very good. 
All right. And then I'm going to move the wheel so you'll see another bit of the machine come up into position. See that part there? And we're going to hook this. I need to get it in that slot there. So it wants to be coming down around through the back and now it's going to head toward this curved needle. And the last step is to thread the needle. So much easier to control with the with the tweezer. There you go. So that's your final thread. And now you have all three threads, and they should all three have about the same amount of tension on them. Now that you've got everything threaded, you've got to put things back. So the first thing to put back is the plate that we removed so that we could see what we were doing. So the, the sewing thread, the black thread, is pretty independent. You can kind of leave that to the side. The red and blue one are going to have to slip into this crevice there as you slip this back on. And then you need your screwdriver to tighten the screw that holds the plate. Did I mention it's a lot quicker if you just tie the threads and pull them through? <laughs> yeah. Um, great. So we have that and that, and then we're going to put the plate back there. And then the last thing is the presser foot, which is going to come back into position, and then you lock it down. So you're turn on the machine. And you don't have to have fabric in this machine to get an overlock stitch. And if everything's working correctly, it should generate a stitch uh, on its own. So. so see if you've got that nice chain and everything looks even, then you've done everything correct. And now you can also add fabric, cut, because this machine will cut and stitch at the same time. And that's how you thread your mirror machine. <laughs> Thank you. This slow motion footage was filmed at a higher frame rate to capture the action of the mechanism. You can see more clearly how the loopers interact with the curved sewing needle to draw out thread and encapsulate the edge of the fabric. Once again, slow motion footage allows us to see how all of these moving parts interact. Even here, I was trying to keep the marrow machine running at a moderate pace, as I discovered full speed is too fast for my camera to catch. Just to help illustrate how the chain of thread is formed, here I'm tracing our red lower looper thread, which zigzags across the underside of the edging. The blue upper looper thread zigzags across the top side, interlocking with both the lower looper and sewing stitch threads. These days, most sewing machine manufacturers offer at least one domestic overlock machine or serger, with four thread being most common. 
We do have a couple modern overlockers in the clock shop, but they're both in need of maintenance. So for comparison's sake, here's a selection from an instructional video on threading a modern Singer overlocker. We're going to thread up the machine for four thread overlock sewing. One thing to remember when you thread your serger is think of it as working from the center out. You're going to do the loopers first and the needles last. So we're going to start with the upper looper, which is this red one. And then we're going to go into the upper looper threading path. You'll notice that it's marked with these red dots. So to thread this, it's kind of like playing connect the dots. And you'll see there's an eye on the upper looper. So we want to put the end of our thread through that eye. The lower looper is threaded next. And now there's a yellow dotted thread path. So we're going to play connect the dots, so to speak. And now we're going to thread the eye of the lower looper. And sometimes it's helpful to use your tweezer for this. So you can kind of push it through and grab him. After the loopers are threaded, we're ready to thread the needles. Remember, we thread from center out. So we're going to start with the green needle thread, which is your right hand needle. We're going to go over the top because that's indicated with green, so we want to follow the green threading path. And this is our right hand needle, so we're going to bring it around the right hand thread guide above the needle. Bring the thread through the eye of the right hand needle. Last is the blue thread, or our left needle thread. Bring it under this thread guide over the top of blue because we're following blue thread path and now we're going to bring that into the thread guide above the left needle and then thread the left needle. We're going to come over here and raise the presser foot lifter Place our fabric in front of the presser foot with a little over the edge so we can see those knives trimming the fabric. Put the presser foot lifter down and step on the foot control to begin sewing. So here's our stitch. We'll see it has the four different colors of thread. The red and the yellow are our looper threads, which are these two right here. The blue and the green are these two, and those are your needle threads. Juki is a Japanese company well known for high quality industrial sewing machinery. They've been in business since 1938 formed as the Tokyo Juki Manufacturers Association and put their first household sewing machine on the market in 1947, following up with their first industrial sewing machine in 1953. We have two Juki industrial sewing machines in the clock costume shop. They both thread the same way, so I chose to demonstrate on this older machine because it was easily accessible amidst the chaos of our shop reorganization. The Juki DDL5530 is no longer offered by the company and doesn't even appear on their website. It's hard to nail down a specific year, but based on examples of user manuals I found online, this sewing machine was manufactured in 1989 or 1990. I'd like to walk you through the process of threading this Juki industrial sewing machine, starting with how to use the bobbin winder here on the side. 
Like most sewing machines, this unit is belt driven, but the belt is fully exposed instead of living inside a machine housing. The bobbin winder is a mechanism that engages with the drive belt to simultaneously wind a bobbin of thread while you sew. It's easy to forget, but you can keep an extra cone of thread on the stand and wind your next bobbin gradually as you stitch. The empty bobbin presses into place on this spindle. Pass the desired thread through this guide eye and between these tension plates, drawing the thread under and toward you. Wrap the thread around the bobbin a few times in a clockwise direction and leave yourself a tail several inches long. You'll want to hold on to this gently as you start to ensure the first winds are secure. You can't disengage the needle mechanism on this machine like you would on a domestic, so if you are winding the bobbin separately from stitching, be sure hands and tools are clear of the needle. Pop the mechanism forward to engage the belt and gently press on the pedal to spin the bobbin. Let go of your thread tail after you feel it take up a bit. The bobbin winder will automatically disengage itself when enough thread has wrapped on to put a little pressure on that small lever protruding into the bobbin channel. If the mechanism is working correctly, you'll have an evenly wound bobbin ready to go right into the bobbin carrier. The bobbin carrier for this Juki looks just like a typical domestic carrier. These tiny screws both secure and adjust tension on the bobbin carrier's pressure plate. You shouldn't need to adjust this very often, but if you find yourself having mystery issues with your stitching, a tightening or loosening here may cure all your ills. We're going to use a bobbin full of white thread to differentiate it from our black top thread. Holding the filled bobbin so that the tail is exiting in a clockwise direction toward your right, drop the bobbin into the carrier and slip the thread tail up into this slanted slot. Manipulate the thread along the edge of the pressure plate until it snaps past the hooked end. The lever handle on the back engages a tiny claw that holds in the edge of the bobbin, so as long as you hold the carrier in this way, the bobbin won't fall out. Now we're going to insert the carrier into the machine with the open side up. If you have trouble seating the bobbin by touch alone, you can slide open this access plate and see inside. I've opened it so you can see more clearly what I'm doing. Make sure the needle is in the up position before you start. As you place the bobbin, you may find it helpful to gently jiggle it back and forth, and it will naturally settle into the proper position. Now let's thread the rest of this machine. Select your desired top thread. Pass it through the eye on this post from back to front. Then guide the thread up and through this small set of tension plates from right to left. This small arm is another device that helps regulate tension. The screw at the top of the machine loosens it so you can position it however you desire. Threading diagrams typically show it in a vertical or diagonal position, so I'll reset this to vertical. We need to thread through all three holes on this little arm from right to left, starting with the top hole. Pass the thread through, bring it towards you to wrap down, and pass through the middle hole from right to left. Repeat for the bottom hole. You'll end up with threads spiraling down the arm like so. This next bit looks like most domestic sewing machines. 
come down and hook into this thread guide. Then draw your thread to the right and guide it through and under the adjustable tension plates. Guide the thread upward along the tension plates just far enough to slip it over this wire spring arm. Now gently pull back toward the left and down so you can hook the thread under this large guide. Next, we have to pass through the eye on the thread to take up, which is protected by this handle-like guard on the front. That guard is there to keep you safe from rapidly moving parts. Never put your fingers inside this area while the machine is running. Once out of the eye, hook through this thread guide and draw the thread downward toward the needle. Hook your thread through this top bent wire thread guide. Then thread through this small eye from front to back so the thread is emerging inside by the base of the needle itself. The final step is to thread the needle from left to right. Not every machine will have the needle oriented in this way. Sometimes you'll find machines that run front to back. Make sure you know the proper needle orientation for your machine before you make any needle swaps. If you've been spoiled by a domestic machine with an automatic needle threader, you might want to keep tweezers or a threading helper nearby. Now let's draw up our bobbin thread. Holding onto the tail of the upper thread, turn the mechanism in reverse by hand and ease it back so the needle dips into the bobbin case. As you complete the revolution, keep a gentle upward pressure on your upper thread tail and a loop of your bobbin thread should emerge. Use a thin object to scoop it out from under the presser foot and make sure you only have a single thread coming out of the bobbin. This machine has two mechanisms for lifting the presser foot. There is a lever on the back that you can flip up or down and the presser foot will stay in that position. Or under the table, there is a slightly padded lever you can nudge with your right knee to lift the presser foot. I can't demonstrate it properly here because my legs are too long, but you get the idea. As I test my stitching, you'll notice that this machine really wants to race off. Industrial machines take a little time to get used to, but you really can get the same fine control you have on a domestic machine. Here I've run a row of stitching, then flipped the fabric and stitched a run nearby so you can see the difference between the front and back. Our white bobbin thread is a little hard to see against this natural muslin fabric. This Juki has a stitch length selector, but can only run straight stitches. I'm not going to thread it, but we also happen to have two of these reliable industrial machines. The reliable 2200 SZ is actually an industrial zigzag machine meant for stitching knit fabrics. It can run straight stitches too, of course. The 2200 SZ is no longer listed on Reliable's website, but can still be found at other retailers. I can't be completely sure how old this particular machine is. It was manufactured from 2007 until quite recently. We have quite a mismatched assortment of household sewing machines, but let's take a look at a couple different vintages of Sears Kenmore models. This older machine looks very much like the one my mother used when I was a child. Mechanical stitch selection with a few decorative and utility stitches available. This model was manufactured between 1975 and 1976. The bobbin mechanism is very similar to the Juki we looked at earlier, accessed by removing this working surface and flipping down a hatch. Now a little newer, but still pretty old. Here's a Kenmore boasting 100 different stitches with a digital stitch selector. This was produced in the 1980s. 
Again, I can't be sure of the exact year, but it's at least as old as 1989. This machine features a drop-in bobbin, which has become pretty typical of these more modern digital machines. There's no separate carrier. Instead, you must guide the thread through a couple small grooves on this housing. To insert a drop-in bobbin, you want the thread coming off in a counterclockwise direction, holding the tail to the right. After settling the bobbin in the hole, gently draw the thread toward the left and catch it into this first slot. Wrap around and let the thread emerge at the second groove. Guide the thread toward the back of the machine and replace the cover plate. It's okay for that thread to pass under the lid, it's not tight enough to get caught. Then you draw up the thread the same way as with the Juki. With the clear cover plate, you can see exactly what the bobbin is doing and monitor how close you are to needing a refill. Now that we've explored some of the sewing machinery in the clock costume shop, let's join Mark in the attic for a quick tour of our costume storage. This is uh, our costume storage area, and it is mostly broken up by epoch or period. Call that petticoat junction in the back. So that's where you can find uh, understructures. Uh, all periods are back there, but they fit together. So petticoats, crinolines, cages, panniers, uh, corsets. We have one area here which is uniforms. So as I mentioned earlier, it's not necessarily by period. It's just, if you're looking for a uniform, it's gonna be in this area. The suits and sports coats are not generally broken up by period because you can fake a lot of things. Um, the shapes are, are not so different. As we go further in, then we have our outerwear, coats, capes, uh, not necessarily by period because you'll see there's uh, some period capes also with some contemporary capes. Moving forward, we have a section on formal wear. So often you'll have an operetta, for example, where all uh, 18 men have to be in tailcoats. So those are all kept together. Now we get into sort of period clothing. So this is uh, roughly medieval renaissance through kind of Elizabethan. Then, this is obviously not chronological, <laughs> then we end up with uh, sort of 20th century, some more coats. Um, these racks here, sort of 1920s through about 1960. We don't really keep anything from after 1960, maybe we have a couple of 70s things, but we don't do a lot of shows in that period. And then on this rack, we start into uh, 19th century, which we would also maybe call Victorian. She reigned for quite a long time and through a lot of different uh, fashion periods. So, but we to generalize, this is sort of the Victorian section. I don't know if you can get around. We're doing some cleanup here, so this is part of that project. Over to this side, uh, we get into what is called Georgian, which also spans uh, a lot of time, but this is where you'll find things for the gondoliers, for example. Uh, a lot of those costumes will be here. And on this final rack here, this is what's called uh, Multiples and Masquerade, which is a horrible title for anything because uh, anything could be in right. Masquerade. But it's basically things that if we have multiples of them, for example, these are the can-can dresses mm -hmm. for Mary Widow. The kind of intentionally costumey pieces. Right. Intentionally yeah. costumey um, things that are not streetwear um, and things. And if you have multiples of something, so you'd have your maids would be in here. Um, people have to match. Uh -huh. uh, and at the end is wedding dresses. And if we want to push through, sure. we find men's trousers are all here, hung in the corner. And if we come around the corner, we get into uh, blouses, shirts, vests. Uh, a lot of things like sweaters and vests are stored in uh, boxes below the rack because they're things that don't necessarily need to hang. That's also true for our skirts, which are mostly in these buckets uh, back here. And they are divided 
mostly by length, which is not the best way to categorize them, but it's the best way for now that we have. Eventually, you'd really want to categorize them by shape and period, um, not necessarily how long they are. Mm -hmm. They did do some serious cleaning back here because I don't remember being able to even walk in this aisle before. Yeah, no, they did. <laughs> and, and they concentrated mostly back here. I also want to update you on construction of the rehearsal hall. Wall framing continues as I showed you last week, but we have reached another milestone. We've received delivery of structural steel. So I have some photographs I've taken of the very first few pieces of steel that have been erected that will help support the roof structure. Thanks for joining me today. Behind the Scenes with Kristen Knudsen is part of our larger series, Digital Clock. Digital Clock is made possible by a generous gift from Phil and Liz Gross. If you'd like to learn more about our programming or how you can become a supporter, please visit us at collegelightoperacompany.com. Be sure to join me again next week as it is our final episode of the summer. I know, time flies. We're gonna be talking about theatrical rigging. I'll demonstrate a few very common knots for you, and we're also going to get a peek into uh, some rope replacement going on in the high field. We are a hemp house, and some of the ropes that suspend the battens are getting a little bit worn out, so we're taking this opportunity while we're dark to swap some line. You'll get to see some of that. So, see you next week. Mm -hmm.